Welcome to the FNO InsureTech Podcast, a place where movers and shakers from all points within the insurance ecosystem gather and discuss all things InsureTech. We talk about how technology and innovation are affecting and driving change in the industry. Here are your hosts, Lee Boyd and Rob Beller. Hello, podcast world. We are back. We are back after a little bit of a hiatus a little bit of uh, time away, and we have another exciting, fascinating FNO Insured Tech podcast for you today. I am your host, Lee Boyd. Your other host, Rob Beller, is not around today. He is at a conference where he is talking to many, many, many fascinating people and has already found two or three new guests for future episodes. So we're excited to have those new guests on. And we're excited to bring you many, many more FNO Insured Techs. Today, we're going to be talking to Alex Martin. Alex is the CEO and co founder of ClearSpeed. ClearSpeed is a technology that uses voice analytics to apply trust or to help you trust. And, and I don't do a good job of explaining what ClearSpeed is. I know what it is, I've learned about it. But I think getting to listen to Alex talk about it is going to be the best thing that we do. He is going to talk about the founding story uh, of his military days, the reason behind ClearSpeed, his venture into insurance, and why insurance is such an important vertical to be in and how it's the focal point. We're going to get to talk all about that and many more things, and I'm excited to introduce to you today Uh, our episode with Alex Martin, CEO and co-founder of ClearSpeed. Welcome, Alex. Thanks for having me, Lee. Man, we are excited. This is one this is one that we've had on the calendar of, you know, one or two times. We weren't able to make the times work, but we got you today. And I am excited to get to learn about you and about ClearSpeed. Happy to talk about it. This is one of my favorite things to do is to talk about ClearSpeed. So you've got my full attention. <laughs> Perfect. So tell me, where do we find you today? Are you home? Are you traveling? I'm up at Dana Point um, at the Property Insurance uh, Conference. It's a fantastic event, incredible venue, stunning views, obviously, but just oh, high, yeah. high caliber people and lots of great discussion happening here today. You know, I've never been to that one, but I've heard just the most wonderful things about it. And in fact, our co-host, Rob Beller, he's there as well, attending a few other meetings. But I've been told that the guest speakers at that conference are really next level. Is that is that what, what you're finding? Phenomenal. I mean, you couldn't ask for a higher caliber of people here. Everyone's got their, their guard down in the sense of collaboration, looking at the future, trying to think through really complicated problems. There seems to be a collegial nature. Um, everyone's just, I think, rolling up their sleeves without guard. And yeah. it's just a different feel than other conferences. And, and there's not kind of this feeling of, of you know, guard and, and, and unease. It's, it's just more around collaboration and discussion and thought leadership, which I think is fantastic. Yeah, thought leadership. That's something that, that we, we need more of. Conferences where you can gain that, I think, I think it's great. I think it's great. So, so happy you're there. So whenever you're not traveling, where, where's home? I live in San Diego. It's where I grew up. Moved back down from the Bay Area during COVID and have planted the flag there for, for the family and for ClearSpeed, though ClearSpeed's all over. And I have a hybrid hybrid strategy to to match our growth plan for our for our talent. But San Diego is where I where I lay my head. Okay. Well, let's jump in. ClearSpeed. It's a company that I personally didn't know anything about. I feel foolish for not knowing about it now that I've done a lot of research. But why don't you let our, our audience know what is what is ClearSpeed? What do you do? Great. Well, it's probably best to start with the founding story to tie it in. We're all about risk identification at scale. So this is think of think of automating a risk assessment process, fraud or security risk. The genesis of the story, it drives through the engine that we have. So we're a voice analytics technology company. We'll talk about what that means, but that's the engine of how we deliver the value that we do. We started back in 2016 as a mostly military founding group, a couple engineers, a couple veterans of the special operations community. 
We had lost a bunch of friends to green on blue attacks. We had been in environments where it was very challenging to tr- make the trade off between speed of movement operationally, tactically, and security. And what, what I mean by that is you're working in remote areas, your teams are small, so under undermanned, under underpowered really from a from an offensive capability standpoint. And you need to rely on local partners to conduct offensive operations. What that means is you need to trust those people and they need to trust you. So one of the okay. elements of working in these areas on these missions is working by, with, and through local partners to help them deal with some of the challenges they have from a security standpoint. It is very, very hard to run a background check on someone in Yemen or Somalia, right? It doesn't right. exist, right? So you're not, you're not running FICO scores and background checks. And what we, what we realized really quickly was this wasn't a lie detection problem. You know, people think that, you know, how you get through a clearance process is to be lie detected, right? And actually the opposite is true. When you think about the, the breakout between that speed and security paradigm, we, we wanted to ask how, how you could get through it by using speed as your security. So here were the elements that baked into the, the founding of the, of the company. We needed something that could be delivered where people couldn't read. It needed to be done in, in any language on the planet, right? So it had to be something that was auditory or speech in nature. The second element is it had to be something that wasn't focused on on detecting a lie, but rather a clearance function. So we wanted to flip the equation. The paradigm was find the bad person, find the needle in the haystack. And part of our innovation in terms of creating an environment where we could innovate and build was actually looking at it from the mindset of saying, let's clear the hay as opposed yeah. to find the needle. And so really then you're not developing, designing, building, deploying a lie detector. You're doing a deployment of a risk accelerator, an identification tool where you're looking for the low risk people. The byproduct of that is you're left with maybe some needles, maybe some other objects. Now here's the thing, risk tolerance varies. Permission per per type of set we were we were looking at operationally. Therefore you could assume more risk in certain areas, other areas you want to assume less. Well that is the job of our counterintelligence people. We only had so many of these folks who are experts in finding the needle in the haystack. But the idea was if we could clear their workload and work on a smaller subset of risk, we could move faster. So by using speed of security, we'd move faster. We'd be working with more trusted agents. The third element of the design was actually getting away from thinking about security on a continuous basis and more around resource allocation. Okay. means if you've only got one counterintelligence guy or gal, you put them on the problem set on a continuous basis. They're able to work through their, their flows easier with with uh, with less friction. And then the you know these weren't our customers, but they were our partners. It resulted in a better experience for them. So we talk about at clear speed getting to trust faster. You don't get to trust faster by strapping them up to a polygraph. You know, walking around with weapons. You know, having a really aggressive stance. What you do is you say you've represented yourself as this person. We don't think you have ties to this militia group or this terrorist organization. We, we, tr- we believe you. Let's verify that with a couple of these other means, one of which is a, a voice analytics tool. Once that produces an output that's low risk, this can be within minutes that we're working together and we've built that trust. So the experience they've gone through is one in which we're extending to them the benefit of the doubt. They're taking a risk with us. We're taking a risk with them, but it's mitigated to a point where we sufficiently feel that we can execute the mission at hand. And they've just had to undergo a quick five-minute automated phone call in their language, asking a couple basic questions. So the magic in this is the magic in this was that we started with a very important problem set where life or death was on the line. We did it by flipping the equation and trying not to make our partners feel like we were interrogating them, right? And that's the genesis of ClearSpeed. And so when you think about a voice analytics technology company that's essentially a resource allocation tool to help clients get to their job faster. In this case, these were our partners that wanted to get paid, feed their families. They had a choice to work for these militia groups. We wanted to keep them on side. This is the experience we try to pull pull together and we did. And so ClearSpeed was founded, designed, built, and battle tested to be able to increase the survivability, the security and safety of our troops by extending trust to the troops we had to work with in the field. So right there, just to verify, it's not that it's not that you're using the technology to pinpoint the bad, but you're using it to point out all the all the low risk, all the good, pass through. I heard you one time say, clear the hay, you know, clear the good, 
trust faster, move through. But tell me a little bit, what is that five minute phone call? What is, what is that? What do you, is it, is it the answer to the question or is it the inflection of the tone? What are you listening for? So what we were able to do, we had a huge data set of yes or no responses at the time in around 12 different languages. We're now up past 43 languages we've deployed in. And these utterances were labeled. So the yes and no's that we had in these languages, we knew which ones were absolutely committing this kind of we'll call it security fraud, representing themselves as something they're not, or having elements of, of risk that they weren't, they were withholding. In this data set, this really rich data set, we were able to tease through and understand which characteristics were in fact associated with low risk and which were high. So once you understand that these characteristics travel in any human speech, so it's a function, it's a neurophysiological function that's like a heartbeat. It, it, it doesn't vary based on gender or culture or race. So you're really detecting these characteristics. That's point number one, step one. And it's going to bake into how the questionnaire works. The second is the questions that are asked and answered. So these must be culturally sensitive. They must be tuned. They must be understood. So if you're delivering it in Arabic, what kind of Arabic? The, the, the mm. questions can't be compound. They have to be very simple, straightforward. And unlike a lie detector, which is trying to push people to a limit of having reactions that make them squirm and having a human look at that reaction and label them as lying or not, we, as you mentioned, are trying to do the opposite. We're trying to not elicit a reaction that would be detected. But the third component is that if it's detected, the question is to what extent? So we were able to build out a proprietary scoring model over many years, working with our special operations forces. We were able to label, get further feedback in an active learning process to understand brackets of risk and where these cross certain thresholds. And that's why we don't talk about lie detection. So if someone has a reaction because the question was asked, have you falsified an information on this claim, right? There's shades of gray packed within there, right? right. And so the questions are tuned to the, to the end user, whether it's in the security application or in the insurance application, these questions are tuned. There's three to four, sometimes five, we think three to four is a sweet spot. They're then packaged and automated and delivered through the cloud. So it's a scalable first touch. And the questionnaire you're getting is meant to fast track, right? Those very simple questions that either a human would ask an answer or a machine would ask an answer, but not have the benefit of our risk intelligence, which is underwriting it. So we're looking at those yes or no utterances. We're running them against our algorithm, right? So this is this could be totally detached from AI. This is just about a detection of risk characteristics. And as we're labeling people low or possible or high risk, it's being labeled on each discrete response. And so at the end of a questionnaire, you might have three or four risk categories and you might have all clear. You might have one question that's an alert. The point is you're getting a very laser focused piece of data that's going to tell you with a high degree of confidence, this person has just cleared all responses. Let's move them faster through a process. If there's an alert, it's more akin to a metal detector. We're not going to, our tech does not say this person is good or bad or committing fraud. That's why I don't think of us as a fraud tool. I think okay. of us as a claims clearance tool and, and an alert tool secondarily, like a metal detector, a human would come on and say very gently, Mr. Boyd, I now need to please see, could you please present this piece of evidence? Could you present a receipt, a picture, something that would happen otherwise, but a very gentle, simple follow-up. Now what's happening at that moment, the magic is that many people drop out of the process. Many people, it's, it gives them a gentle way to exit something oh. doing on the bad. So if you think about human nature, you know, and you think about the world of, of fraud, about a third of the people will never commit fraud. A third yeah. of the people will always commit fraud. And the bit in the middle are good folks who may make a bad decision. Maybe they're stuck for some cash, maybe, and they justify it. They say, you know what, this insurance company yeah. or this American military organization has been doing these things and I feel like this is, this is morally okay. But if they get an intervention that's gentle and responsible, they may opt out. So we're seeing a huge amount of dropout rates. We're seeing people that actually make admissions, you know, in stride to that human that does the follow-up. And sometimes it's just a conversation where things can get cleared up. But nevertheless, that conversation is happening on a fewer amount of people. Because as I said, yeah. what we're doing is we're clearing it. So to answer your question, the questionnaire is packaged with client-defined questions based on the use case. So we're focused on, you know, life underwriting or disability or PNC claims, whatever the case may be. These questions are prepackaged. They're delivered in a very easy fashion to the, to the consumer's phone, the customer's phone. They're clicking a link to fast track their claim. 
They're engaged in a series of yes or no responses with a, with a script on either end telling them about this, that this is a fast track tool, et cetera. No high risk claim, no high risk alert will, will harm them in any way. But again, that's the experience. It automated first touch to get you moved through faster. And we're seeing claim settlements going from 15 and 21 days down to three days, two days. Soon it could be within minutes. You know, the more that, the more that our um, clients continue to, to, once we're embedded, trust our data points, you know, we could get to a point where this time next year, a clear speed green means a payment within the, within the same minute that that call has been put through. That's where we could go with this. But where we're at now is, is a focus on using these automated questionnaires as a positive outreach to the, to the person filing that claim or submitting that, um, you know, that, that life insurance policy and a yeah. way to move faster in a more fr- in a friction, a frictionless way. I mean, that's just, that's amazing, but you've got to take me back. You've got to let me know. How did we go from, from being over working with, with the military, right? You're working to see if you can trust these, these village groups or the, these individuals who are going to be helping you to, to talking about insurance. Yeah. What, what did that journey look like? Yeah. So that's a function of capitalism. It's a good thing. Okay. Thing. So we were a bunch of, you know, military people focused on a military problem. You have to raise venture capital to progress the technology. Yes. People that invest in technology are rightly uh, interested in growth and other markets. And so uh, as one of our progressions through our own um, fundraising journey, the investors challenged us to identify markets outside of government and military. It's a very logical progression if we were just going to be a GovTech company to go from military and then see how we could help with people at refugee camps and security clearances and, and on and on. So you can tell a really compelling story about the government growth trajectory, and it's one that we still do. But what they challenge to do is say, look commercially and see where this problem is pervasive and the core technology would need to change. You just need to build products for those markets. And so we did a market study and there's tons of applications from, from consumer, you can think about the gig, the gig economy, you know, Uber drivers self-selecting to help get themselves, you know, kind of gold banners for not being violators of certain elements that would put people at risk to elements of banking. And, uh, and so there's a world of possibility for clear speed, but we focused on, well, because we're a glutton for punishment, we said, what's another really big, slow moving uh, <laughs> market? And we chose insurance because we're glutton right. for punishment. But no, we really chose it because we said, look, number one, fraud is an incredibly pervasive problem and it's very expensive. Number two, we believe that that the same trade-off that we had in the military, which remember was that one-for-one trade-off at the time between moving faster or detecting security risk, that same trade-off in our interviews of the market were happening with insurance companies. So they had to say, we could process every claim touchless instantly, but our fraud rates would go through the roof. Mm-hmm. Well, we, we, could find all, we could find all the fraud in the world, but we wouldn't process any claims. So they seem to have that same tension between speed and fraud, speed and risk. And so we thought, okay, there's a good calculation to see how we could you know, inject into workflows to help move that along and use speed of security. And the third element was, remember, we weren't coming at it as a fraud tool. Fraud is a big problem, right. but we're not coming out on the fraud side. Same way in the military, we said we want to come at it from the clear the hay side. So claims, underwriting, at the first notice of loss, the ability to inject a questionnaire and accelerate a process. So those are the bets we made. The, the, the last bet we made was on voice. And voice is really exciting. There's a great book that's that's just come out. I actually keep it, keep it here with me, but it's on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. It's phenomenal. It talks about voice as the ultimate interface. It's called The Sound of the Future. It's by a guy named Tobias Dengel, The Coming of Age of Voice Technology. So here's my shameless plug for, uh, for Dengel's work. Fantastic read. And what he talks about, though, is when you think about the interface of the future, it's going to be voice. It is voice. It's progressing. And how we experience Siri and Alexa and the smart homes and everything we do in our car is actually just the very beginning of where we're going to go from grabbing information call, you know, chat GPT, everything that's happening with being able to search large data sets. And really, it's beyond search, right? It's calling information. And what we're doing is saying, no, no, it's going to be able to lead to some kind of action. So someone should be able to say, hey, Alexa, I want to re-up my life insurance policy. And you should be engaged in the process without touch, without talking right. to you. And, and the productivity and the scale that that has is phenomenal. So there's a promise in voice. We're a part of that voice kind of revolution 
we're coming at it from a risk engine standpoint. And as I said, remember, we're not going for the, for the find the fraud, we're going for clear it. So to answer your question, we, we kind of had an early sense that voice was the future. I mean, we believed in voice, you know, now seven years ago, and we're, we're just more bullish on it every year. And we think that the combination of all those things made insurance the perfect market for us to go in and say, look, we're not here to revolutionize the claims process. Same way we're not going to the DOD, uh, Department of State, these other groups and saying, we're going to revolution. No, what we're doing is we're saying, look, part of your evolution needs to be moving faster. You can't hire headcount against problem. If you get it wrong, there's massive repercussions. So let's inject, get some good incremental lift to your workflows. And in that way, you'll find great value. And yeah. Talking how we talk to our government stakeholders is the same way we talk to stakeholders of insurance because they're both folks with massive amounts of responsibility. They have incredible amounts of, of risk and they're trying to, in their own ways, grow their enterprise and do it against macroeconomic conditions, geopolitical conditions that are unpredictable. You know, you're not predicting ground wars in Europe. You're not predicting Silicon Bank going out of business and, and, and you know, the tremors there. You're not predicting inflation staying high for quarter over quarter. You're not predicting rising unemployment. You're not predicting October 7th. You're not predicting all these things which put downward pressure on your business and your enterprise. And so we need to be able to help give them some offset and some immunity from some of these um, elements. And the only way to do it in insurance is to keep your customer satisfaction really high, is to retain the customers you have, attract new customers, and grow your business by reducing fraud and keeping overhead at a manageable level. So OPEX has to stay low. I can't hire 100 more people next year. I got to yeah. keep the folks I have. I got to use good data to keep them trained. And I got to get lift. And it needs to be incremental lift, not exponential lift. And that will have the outcome. So that's that's how we kind of journeyed over insurance. And that's the story that we've told. And now we're showing in the numbers that as we're progressing from some of these other pilots that are now getting adopted and you're seeing these awards in the market we're getting. And that's really just an yeah. industry. And that we're we're trying to partner with these people to help them do a really hard job. I mean, yeah, we were. I was. I looked at an article earlier, and I think it was eight, maybe nine awards in 2023 that ClearSpeed has obtained. That's a big deal. That you're you're being noticed by the industry, right? You're being noticed. I mean, you. I mean, you have a great head on your shoulders. The knowledge that you're bringing, it it, it kind of made me think. You went from the military to insurance. Two different worlds. Sure, there's some, you know, you can say there's, you know, some things that are the same, but it's different. I mean, what did what did what did you do to have to start speaking insurance ease, right? To yeah. be able to to walk up to an insurance person and to be able to carry a conversation. What kind of training did did, did you take yourself through? Yeah, to anchor it in the culture of clear speed, you know, it's quiet professionalism. So the first thing is we don't come into a new market and assume that we, we, we know anything, actually quite the opposite. So let's listen and learn. We present this thing that we built and created that is having incredible results on the military side. And you hope that by having kind of um, a humble first, you know, with humility, you're coming into the market and you're saying, here's something that may work for you. Would you try it? And on that adoption curve, a lot of people said, no, like there's so yeah. much it's new and you know you don't speak my language and they were right yeah so as, and as that was going forward you find your first couple adopters Our, ours happened to be a company in guatemala called el roble they found us at insuretech when we had in las vegas when we had no insurance customers and we had built out the thesis that i had told you and we had said this this could be something that would work they were the first adopter they knew that we had no other customers insurance and n number of years later, I think they signed with us in 2017, 18 was the pilot, and then they converted in 2018. Year over year, they're having millions of dollars of savings. They've been expanding. They're taking us over to their bank for other uh, products, for micro lending. It's a credible relationship. But they were the first adopters. We were then carried over into the UK market by a couple of kind of mavericks and pioneers. And then you look at the UK market. And what's fantastic about the UK market is, first of all, it's the birthplace of insurance. And I feel that in that market, there's a sense of, there's a kind of a sense of this, this is ours to, to lead. And they, they, we, we want to be first. We want to try. We're not afraid to take some risk with some new companies and new products. And they, they fail things really fast. They're very, uh, it's a very smart market. It's a very small market. It doesn't have, you know, the complexity the U.S. market has in many ways. And yeah. they were able to take the kind of early indications from our South American work and say, there may be a there there. And then through that evolution, we were hiring people that spoke insurance ease, as you said, and that allowed us to build out 
the ability to then go to increasingly up up the value chain, you know, and and be able to articulate within not only the markets, each company is different and should be treated differently with their own problems, their own strategy, their own roadmap. And by hiring these kind of couple key people from our product and engineering side and our sales organization, our marketing organization, we're able to then still be quiet professionals, but at least be able to speak the language, which is so important because then that comes through in the messaging they receive, they hear the features that they want on the products that they tell us they want. We listen, we build them where we can't build. We're honest about that what the limitations are of the tech. We're honest about that, where we could go. We say, would you like to build together as partners? And so this first group, 2023, these awards aren't ours. These awards are really that of the people that have been adopting us in 2022 and 2023, because they're the ones that have informed our own roadmap, our own vulnerabilities and limitations. We're not perfect. We're not a magic wand. We're not a silver bullet. We are, you know, do some incredible things. But th- th- those awards were, was a progression around, again, entering in the market saying, look, we work for really serious people doing serious stuff. So are you. There's a reflective nature, I think, in people that have hard work to do. Mm-hmm. They needed their humans augmented with some good intelligence. You know, we provided that. They gave us a chance. We demonstrated some good results. We've informed our product roadmap based on these learnings. We've hired key people that now speak it. And so now for you know me to be on this podcast, you know, I'll be the first to say, you know, I'm learning every day what people listening to this, you know, have forgotten before their first cup of coffee. But what I do know is risk. What I do know is that tech enabling great humans enables great growth. You know, people were afraid of the tractor when it came. Farmers will be out of business. No, it just is an inflection point for being able to harvest more, produce more food security. Similarly, as an AI power tool, we'll be doing the same. And so in that way, we're building it out. And I think 23 with these awards is simply an indication that so far, and we must maintain this as our culture, we listen, we learn, we serve, and then we think about how we can get better every day. Wow. That's awesome. So tell me what in, in the insurance world, what is the what is the market you're going after? You you mentioned underwriting, you mentioned claims. Where is clear speed? Where does it need to sit or does it need to sit everywhere? And is it property? Is it is it medical insurance? Is it uh, business? What what where do you see it sitting? So our progression started on the fraud on the fraud side and and that was a good place to start. Because what we're able to do is we're able to layer in to the fraud ecosystem and demonstrate that we're a, a tool that, that helps them and they help us, right? And, and so there's this kind of multimodal approach. So I think we have a good firm place that we can demonstrate. If you want to put us on your, uh, on your fraud side, you know, if you post an indication of fraud and you want to have a clear speed inter- interview, which may decrease some false positives, help, help your fraud teams, your SIU teams do better, we have a place there. What we've also demonstrated is that up upstream at the first notice of loss, there's a great place there because now what we're able to do is we're able to help, you know, identify fraud really early. But mm-hmm. remember first, we're actually just identifying the absence of fraud. If that's a thing. Right. Right? And so so the first notice of loss for us is, you know, independent of claim type is is great. Um, and, and that's a great place where we can sit. So you can even have it at both, you know, indication here, a second interview right before you know, augmenting your frisk, your shift, you know, uh, whatever other systems you're using for fraud, SIU, augmenting them. Those humans, those fraud teams aren't going to go away. They shouldn't. They need to be supercharged, right? And so the first note of loss is really important. And then you think about our journey then, okay, well, if that's working, the reason why we're talking about underwriting is because now you have the ability to get a touch, a touch point where that, you know, the, all the actuarial work that's happening can be better informed. You know, what's what's the cost of one one great data point against how you're assigning risk and how you're calculating what premium you put on that and what you're underwriting. Do you want to go into new markets where there's not a lot of data? How do you write that risk? You know, well, with a little more confidence, you can use clear speed and get into new markets with people that deserve insurance and they need insurance. Everyone needs insurance and but but there's risk associated with those things. And so you've got to look at that. So I think that our progression from from there to the kind of the kickoff of of really any element of the insurance cycle from end to end is where we could play. Now, within that, there may be certain books of business or certain elements where they don't, they, they think, no, we don't need the clear speed at, at this point. We got it from here. That's great. You know, there may be, there may, you know, we have a customer that, you know, is looking at auto and for them, they feel really good about how their profile looks for risk on auto. Great. But for other elements of their book, they're like, man, I've got an incomplete picture. Let's start here, build it out. And then there's learnings to, okay, actually this part of auto, we don't know. We feel like we're un, under 
covered with how we're thinking of risk with this element of the book. And so that's an evolution. So it'd be hard for me to say we should be everywhere, but yeah. it's easier for me to say on a customer by customer basis, where you experience friction pain is a great place for to start with your learning of clear speed. Wow. I mean, I can see so many places that it, it can be used. And I'm also sitting here thinking about trust, right? You've you've been you've been in this with this company doing this since 2016. So we're looking at what, seven, eight years there. Has it has it changed the way you you look at people? All the knowledge you've taken. You know, I am I'm beyond trusting. Everybody's yeah. good. Everybody's great. Uh, where my my counterpart Rob is like, you need to not believe anything, and and not everybody is greatly. But I I just I listen to somebody and I'm like, oh, they're just the sweetest person. They would never do anything wrong. I mean, what have you? I, I guess what has it done to you? And and should I be that trusting? <laughs> Yeah. No, I mean, so I think about it often, right? So, you know, I'm an eternal optimist. It's my greatest strength and my greatest weakness. And I like to surround myself like you with people on the team that have different worldview. That, that's how you, that's how you, I think, manage, you know, your business and your, and your enterprise. But you no, know, my, my earliest indication, look, I grew up in La Jolla, California, mm-hmm. of a lovely place in the world and everything's 70 and sunny and it's a wonderful life. And when I, when I joined the Marine Corps, you, you meet America and then you go overseas and you meet the world and you realize the world is really hard and these are hard people. And I would say that, you know, if I had to make a call, most people are good. Now, what's most, right? Most people are good. Right. So we won't put a number on that. But, you know, it, but, but that said, it, it is the minority of bad people, bad actors that caused me a lot of pain in my early years. So 20 years ago, I'm looking across the table at people going, this is a good guy. This is a farmer that's trying to feed his family. We should take some risk on him. And that led to lives of my buddies being lost. So right. real hard lessons in where trust can go bad. And so the you stop trusting all people. If you do that, you never leave the wire or you don't do business in the insurance world because everyone's going to commit fraud. Do you want to get up in the morning? It's a depressing place. But when you think about it as a function of this minority group of people represent greater harm to the people that are good and to, and to us. And, and then you get back to that tension, that one for one tension. So I think of it saying, look, in order to m- mitigate the risk of, the, of those minority, let's favor the vast majority of people who aren't committing fraud or aren't a risk to us. And so it's, I think it's tools like ours, and we're just one of many, that need to ultimately augment the most important intelligence, which is human intelligence, to use their gut and their judgment to assume risk. And that's the other, that's the other hardest point is like, do you, if you believe that, that trust is an ancient exchange, we do. And do you believe that it's very hard to get to trust, very easy to lose it. And then the next thing you have is the ability to, if person is on the margin from breaking your trust, the sweet lady that, you know, doesn't have any other indicators of committing fraud. And she's committing one of the most egregious cases of fraud you've ever seen. Right. How, might, how might you get ahead of that and have a conversation with that person to make them do the right thing. That's human intelligence. AI can never do that. AI will never yeah. be, able to do that. you know, I, I never say never, I never say always, but I'm saying never because the human nature is going to be me looking across the table at he or she and having a conversation where stakes are on the line and you compel them to do the right thing ahead of the post, we call it post blast, you know, left of boom, right of boom. You know, you want to be ahead of bang and say, before this event happens, this is, this is where we need to take you. Now, that said, while you're having those conversations with those people who right on the margin, there are going to be people that are coming after you every single day. Their mission in life is to infiltrate your unit. Their mission in life is to attack you when you're outside the wire. Their mission in life is to make every single attack on your company from an insurance standpoint, every claim, sophisticated fraud networks. You're not going to, you're not going to use human intelligence to get these people to say, to see the light and appeal to some you know, faith-based system or some value system that they're going to say, you know what, my mom wouldn't, would not like if I did that, whatever it is, right. those people are bad people. And so you need to keep a highest concentration of offensive capability against those people in the insurance world. That's your fraud detection system. That's your SIU. That's how you look in the market. You're not, you're not coming off as, as a super soft organization. That's a good target. So you got to look hard, you got to be hard and you got to keep all these capabilities fighting this pervasive and growing element of fraud. But the real threat is in this opportunistic element of population. 
And that's where I think trust is a huge expanse for, for trust faster because you can go after this group, you can show firmness, but you can be fair. You know, we talk about this balance. I like to think of this balance of grace and accountability. So you, you extend all this grace. You keep people accountable. They need to be accountable. They understand that you are accountable to your organization and the other people in the claims process. And in this way, I'm bullish on trust. And yeah. even in this depressing world we're in today, um, I remain optimistic to the extent that we can employ tools that augment human intelligence to keep the opportunistic folks on side. And, yeah. and that I think that I think is the is the future. It's 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 got to be the currency of, of the future, and and you have to maintain a balance between your offensive capability against those that don't care and will do harm at all costs, and those that may be making a bad decision. Um, and really, then you're going to protect your good folks that are just trying to get on with their lives, get their claim processed, or that farmer that wants to make the paycheck for their family. Right. I was I was just recently doing my uh, CE credits for my adjuster license, and we learned about hard fraud and soft fraud, and it was whole. It was actually two things on fraud, and how some people some people mean to do it right. They go after it, and they're they're mean. Others are like, well, I had a claim. Let me add this extra bit to it. Sure. And then the others who are who are good. You're saying a third, a third, a third. It, it really is. It really is interesting what you're trying to do. Is you're trying to to clear the group. Let's say all these are positives, right? All the, you know, get get the vast majority of the people through the gates and let's ring the bell whenever we have a problem. And that's where we're going to focus. We submit to SIU, to underwriting, uh, to whatever it may be. And that's how we bring kind of this elevated trust faster, which is a great vision. That's yeah. where we bring down to brass tacks, which is resource. You're talking about resource optimization. And so yeah. we're, we're kind of, you know, the the sexiest resource allocation tool I think available, right? Like we're doing a really, <laughs> we're doing a blocking and tackling thing. I like to think of ourselves like the offensive line for a company. And by the way, that's just one member of your whole offensive line. You got a lot of folks that are doing thankless work. You got a lot of IT systems. You got a lot of infrastructure that's doing thankless work. The day to day is moving your business forward, but you don't get anywhere with the offensive line, right? And so right. we need to be able to bring trust faster down to this offensive line mentality where we're really doing resource optimization at scale. And that's where we go from elevated kind of like, well, what does that mean to me? Well, let's talk about one plus one equals three. And that's mm -hmm. that's a cliche, but it, it, it matters when you can put some tech in place and put some systems in place that help you get lift against the challenges you have for your spend plan. You know, there's only so many things you can move, you know, numerator and denominator. There's only so much math you can do to meet your plan for that year. And if we can help move that, then that's what we're aiming to do. And, and, and in that way, that's the trust faster, but kind of at the brass tax level. I, I think that's great. So is uh, clear speed still working in the, in the military world? Are you still well, able to do that? We are. Yeah. We're, we're fortunate to be, you know, a dual use tech company. So we have a, we have, we have one arm of our business that is focused on government defense security. We're doing some exciting stuff in the world of sports integrity. So what's sports integrity? anti bribery yeah. anti-doping. We're doing some incredible work with a group out of London called Herod. They are phenomenal human experts in bribery and corruption and fraud. We're augmenting them. And we have a really exciting path there. We're doing work in citizenship by investment, helping with kind of know your client kind of applications from a security standpoint. We're also doing some work in, in foreign allied militaries, our own military, for some of the stuff we started on. That's something that is part of our foundation, who we are. And uh, that's work that, you know, we'll never have to give up because it's it's about serving those, you know, that we we started to serve. And yeah. uh, and that's really exciting. Now, growing outside of a military application, you know, doing work with refugees, doing work to help, you know, probation, you know, monitor sex offenders, these kinds of things, which are pervasive and, and really community safety. These are things that we believe we can help on and think there's a, you know, there's a financial imperative to go after good business. We are. There's a moral yeah. imperative when this is over, you know, and I, you know, I hope it's never over, but you know, when our business progresses and keeps evolving, you know, we're going to look at ourselves and say, we were a really successful company. We did good. Now on the other side of our insurance side of business, you know, that's our primary focus commercially. We could have picked, you know, 10 other markets to go after. We picked insurance. Right. I'm happy we did. And I'm really seeing incredible amounts of innovation creativity, collaboration that's happening in this market. Yeah, things move slow from a sales cycle process, but people are working to truncate that, make it easier on insure techs to come up, try, test, you know, work in an environment that that folks, because I think the folks know they have to innovate or die. They have to evolve. And so it, it, it's all about who you're placing your bets on. Some of these companies 
could be gone a year from now. You know, that's tough. So if right. you don't have you don't have a hardened balance sheet, you're going to be taking a bet on these guys. So there, there may be some risk in deciding who you're going to start with. But as our government defense security business grows, the commercial business is our, is our main effort. And where they, where they unite, kind of why they come together, the tech is the tech. And that's really exciting for us. Like we're not having to change the core engine of what we deliver. The products that we deliver are different. Catastrophic you know, events and insurance, we might have an on, we do, we have an on-demand product we built for catastrophic events. So if you have surge capacity and all of a sudden you need 10,000 calls to go out to blanket a region to help you triage that first touch, we can do that, you know, but there's a similarity between that and what happens after an event with refugees or what might trigger an event for FEMA, you know, and so there's, there's synergies in the corp tech, the derivative products and the go-to-market engine at the end of the day, if I'm sitting across from a general or a senior executive in government, or I'm sitting across from a senior executive in insurance, I'm looking at a man or woman who has a burden and the burden yeah. is around deploying resources efficiently and managing the security fraud versus speed paradigm. And we're here to come to them and say, you're all underwriting risk at scale in an incredibly challenging environment and you need help. I mean, I, I love listening to you. It is it is so important what what you're doing. I mean, yes, on the insurance side, super important, right? Reducing fraud, uh, reducing extra costs going out, which raises the premiums of of everybody in the world who pays insurance, right? You're you're doing that, but then you're saving lives. You're who can I trust to help protect these people? Who is in this camp? Who shouldn't be in this camp? Like there is so much that you're doing, and even on the sport, that was fascinating. Out of all out of all all the things you're working on, what is the most exciting? I mean, what and I, you know, I don't know if about exciting is the right word. What, what motivates you the most? Is it, is it working on the military aspect, the betting, the, the sports, the insurance? What, what kind of gets you going? There's two parts to that response. The first is, I mean, where we started with this, you know, if you would ask me seven and a half years ago, what success would be, you know, it would, it was f- focused around creating value around the ability to, you know, make sure that no, no more lives were lost overseas. Right. And yeah. the ability work in that green on blue, we call it a green on blue incident. And once we got there, so now we're being used in that context, you know, you say, okay, what, what's next? But it feels good to be able to continue to grow and scale in that, in that use case and see where that goes. But, but similarly, what really gets me excited, if you think about, and the insurance market is leading this, if you think about everything people do centers around insurance, Elon Musk does not send his spaceships to space uh, without it being insured, right? Right. No, no one. No one is moving goods, food, people, products without insurance. And so everything we do in this world for for growth, for advancing, is underpinned by the insurance market. And so if I think about the ability to not only support that, but then also say, all right, now there's this huge growing population around the world, these billions of people that are going to be coming from extreme poverty to poverty to now actually getting their head above the bar and what that means for their children, yeah. we have the ability to sit there and go, all right, we should be able to extend a line of credit to small shareholder farmers or new immigrants here to the US who want to start a business. You know, They need to be able to grow, live the American dream. And to the extent we can use our insurance work as leverage to help, help people get insured that otherwise wouldn't, help people get credit that otherwise wouldn't, that's in our roadmap. We're going to do that. And you know, really what you're then talking about is yeah, you're helping people who are in immediate, you know, kind of that trauma, put the put the dressing on, keep them alive. Well, how do you help people grow? And it's really going to be a function of the free market. It's going to be a function of, you know, people's ability to live in a liberal democracy or an environment that allows for people to grow and change if it's not a democracy. And in that way, insurance is going to be right there at the ground level. Nothing will move. No businesses will get started. No capital will get raised or deployed. No products will get innovated and launched into these new markets or even in existing markets where growth is happening from people that are underserved without insurance. And if we can be a part of that, then I'm going, man, the Alex of seven years ago had no clue that this was right. even a possibility. And food will be on tables. People will be getting educated. You know, and that only grows as a function of people's ability to innovate, you know, to make, make money for their families and to progress their lives. We want to be a part of that. Man, that is fantastic i mean you got to have value in what you do you wake up every day and and you might not think it but you are moving value right you are giving people value you are doing something different <laughs> truly saving lives 
saving dollars, helping the world. So Alex, we're here at our time at the end of the day. I, I just want to say thank you for being on. I really enjoy learning about ClearSpeed today and about everything you did. And also I want to say thank you for, for your service. Thank you for all that, all, all that you serve for us. Thank you very much. Honor to be here and learning every day and could be more excited to be a part of what's happening in this market. Great. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Lee. I'd like to say thanks so much to Alex for being on today. I really enjoyed getting to learn about clear speed. I had done a lot of research before the podcast and I was I was fascinated to get to hear the actual story from the man himself and and what it did. He's really out there changing the world. He's out there not just in, not just in insurance, although he's a he's a big deal in insurance, but he's out there with a grand vision and uh, it seems like they're really headed in a great direction. So we want to say thank you, Alex, so much for being on. Thank you to his team uh, who is on today as well, uh, Danny and Neha, uh, for for sitting in and, and watching. So thank you. And Rob, we're sorry that we missed you today. We hope that you enjoyed the conference. Got to find us a few more guests there. And we hope that you were able to meet up with Alex at the uh, Cookie Happy Hour. And we want to say thanks for Alicia for being on. Uh, Aldrin, we miss seeing you. But we'll get to have you on next time, I'm sure. And to our guest, thank you once again for always tuning in and listening to FNO Insure Tech. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>